genre of animated series, and within that, a subgenre of animated series based on comic books. And within that is our microgenre of image comics animated series. I even went into storage and got out this old vintage 1994 Greg Capullo Violator shirt that I got in 1994 from my dad, I think. He picked it up at the comic shop, and I went and found a few other things. So as we go through, I'm going to pull up a, a few little bits of nostalgia. But first, let's stave off a little likely criticism. All of animation is a genre. I know there's a dispute about this, but we can just disagree. Genre means a convention of cinema, and at its most basic, genre are just descriptors, right? Labels to make it easier to describe what kind of movie we're talking about. Black and white's a genre. When we used to have video stores, there were these signs in all the different sections, right? There would be an action section, a romance, drama, foreign films, animation, I mean, otherwise, why make a section for foreign films? It's because some people really enjoy those aesthetics, and it's a way of beginning to describe a type of film that you're looking for. So a French foreign film could also be a comedy or a romance, and genres all overlap. And so that's why we can have an action comedy period movie that's also been animated. Now, when I was 12 and getting into comics around 1992, I had no idea that all the top talent was getting into a war with Marvel and DC Comics and going their own way by forming Image Comics. I just knew that Todd McFarlane's Spider-Man was not like my dad's Spider-Man. It was a whole different animal and it spoke to me. So when I went to the store and saw McFarlane's name on a new book, maybe it was in Wizard Magazine actually, but the word was out. Image Comics were the books that kids my age wanted to read. Now, Image started with seven Maverick creators who would each make their mark with titles that would sell millions of their first issues and catapult most of them into being millionaires overnight. And with that superstar status, opportunity availed itself. Toys, and video games, and trading cards. This was a bummer. These were all widescreen cards, like extra long cards that McFarlane put out for his first set. Completely awful. Collected them all. But then later, he released chromium cards that were a regular actual... Let's just open this one up here. Regular size cards, but all chromium. Like that. That's a cover from spawn number six, I believe. Overkill. Pretty cool. If you're interested in more of the Image comic story, then I highly suggest you check out Image Revolution, which is basically the definitive Image Comics documentary. And in the meantime, we're going to be going over all the major animated releases from the big Image 90s creators, starting with Wild Cats in 1994. Wildcats was Jim Lee's creation. He was having huge success doing X-Men. X-Men number one sold 8 million issues, so when it came time for him to do his own book, it made sense for him to choose something, I don't know, similar looking. The Wildcats, Cat being a covert action team, were aliens fighting a secret war of, with another race of aliens on Earth. Kind of like Transformers, but not robots. The first series of Wildcats ran about 50 issues, and since then there have been other incarnations. And then, Jim Lee sold his part of Image to DC Comics. The Wildstorm imprint, that is. So if you're wondering why you rarely see these characters anymore, now you know. In fact, as I'm recording this video, this very month, DC put out a brand new Wildcat book. It's got about half the team members that were in the original. But uh, check out how shiny this foil cover is. Throwback to 90s ridiculousness. The series was produced by Nilvana which is a Canadian animation company started in Toronto, whose credits you might know include Clone High, Tintin, Babar. I'm just talking to old people now, aren't I? Uh, the Magic School Bus is another one, uh, but scores of others as well. Wildcats only had a run of 13 episodes as a Saturday morning style cartoon, kind of in the realm of X-Men or Spider-Man from that same time period on Fox. I think the team translated pretty well to the screen, but maybe like the concept of the book, it was all a little too generic to stand out to a new generation. People weren't buying Wildcats comics for the stories, and the animated series didn't have that Jim Lee art. 
As a final note, there was also a short-lived Wildcats animated series comic book, kind of similar to DC's Batman the Animated Series comics, so from comic to cartoon, and then back to comic again. Pretty cool. The circle is complete. Most of us inhabit at least two worlds. The real world, where we're at the mercy of circumstance, and the world within YouTube's stinking algorithm that refuses to acknowledge fair use. So instead of listening to the cool opening refrain of the Max, you get this butchered version with a cranky content creator who has to find creative ways to circumvent this crap. I mean, it's literally just the opening theme song portion in a video that's essentially an ad for their product. I could have destroyed the entire video in frustration. Yeah, screw it. I think I'll have some fun first. <laughs> While Sam Keith isn't strictly a founder of Image, he was there within the first few years, and along with creators like Dale Keown, who made The Pit, Keith Giffen's Trencher, and Mark Tixera on The Union, they formed a sort of second wave of talent. And besides, you're not going to talk about animated series and leave the Max out of it. Whether as a comic or MTV series, the Max has aged maybe the best out of all these early image efforts. MTV produced a series of 10-minute filler episodes for their MTV oddities. They went to Rough Draft Studios, who had recent success with Beavis and Butthead. The Max is a fantasy series in the guise of a superhero book to provide cover for a more thoughtful look at human relationships and dealing with personal trauma. The main villain of the story, Mr. Gone, is a serial rapist and carries Characters in this series retreat into a fantasy world where they have a double life as a superhero or a jungle queen in a very Australian looking alternative reality called the Outback. Is it just in their minds? Is it real? Is the Max a rabbit? These are all good questions in an even better series. Now the 13 episodes are more adult oriented than most animated series of its time. The cheap flat style is almost panel for panel, shot for shot to the comic with some actual panels from the book. Some Ralph Bakshi-esque rotoscope in places, pitch-perfect voice actors, a true love letter to the book with all the eccentricities you'd expect, even the toenail clipping scene. At least that's what the villain told me, but who can believe a villain? We can ask Sam how that all came together. Got lucky, you know, on it. We didn't really relate to how lucky we were until after the fact. Okay, and what was the creative process like? It was just really bizarre time where I had a chance to just pull monkeys out of my ass. Some of the monkeys may have been legal hurdles. In the early days, the Image Boys were excited to share their characters and have them guest star in each other's titles. That didn't always pan out for them, though. For example, issue 6 had a shark guy from Savage Dragon, and in issue 7 and 8, there's a two-part story where the Max shrinks down to Rescue Ranger size and teams up with the Pit, this gray Hulk-looking metalhead created by fellow Canadian Dale Keown, who at the time was a long-haired metalhead guy. In the series, they had to be changed into a different kind of shark guy and this very Sam Keith looking Gollum dude. And whether as a comic or an animated series, the Max has maybe aged the best out of all of these. Anybody looking to read the series will be happy. The Max was collected into beautiful hardcovers by IDW, and in the process, that publisher rescanned all of the original artwork for their Artist Edition, which is a really cool, oversized hardcover that has full color scans of original black and white artwork, so you get like the pencil lines underneath, or you can see the whiteout, or where they cut out dialogue blurbs and glued them into place. It's a pretty beautiful thing, and amazing that the Max gets that treatment. While they were in that process, they also made the decision, since they had all this newly scanned black and white artwork to clean up, that they could digitally recolor it. This is a great opportunity for Sam Keith to go in and tweak it to get a more accurate version of what he wanted from the comic. He explained back in 1993 that while the comic's first issues were hitting the press, he was already flying back and forth to his home and the animation studio to oversee that production. And with such limited time, many parts of the comics were colored without his supervision in order to make deadlines. Now he's been able to rectify that. Keith also provides new covers for every reprinted image. So they called it the Max Maximize. And you can see here, we've got the uh, original cover, but recolored. So here's the original cover. I'll probably end up just putting this in like an edit, but uh, like editing it in, but the original cover and then the CG colored cover, you can see they're fairly similar, but anyway. And uh, 
and then he paints a new cover that's like an homage to the original or something close, but a new version just for that. Two covers for every issue, all 35. I think it's 35 issues. I got them all. If you want even more of the Max, you can trade me for some of these sweet Max trading cards, right? Collected the whole set. No, I'm just kidding. I would never trade for these. If you really want more Max stuff, then I would suggest you ask your local comic shop about the Batman Max Arkham Dreams hardcover. Uh, I think there might be a soft cover by the time you see this video, but there's a hardcover out for it. It's a great mini series, as long as it keeps you away from the Max cards. Chicago. Ordinary cops were losing the battle. The criminal mastermind called Overlord and the super freaks held our city in their terrifying grip. Now we have the dragon. Eric Larson, the savage dragon. He's a big green guy with a fin on his head. Huh? Right? All makes sense now? Did it just for this episode? He's got amnesia and he becomes a cop. He has super strength, tough skin, regenerates like Wolverine for most damage. At least that's how it started. This series has now been going for hundreds of issues and it's still running, still drawn, and written and inked and I think for the most part colored by Eric Larson and it's the only original image book to do so. One of the rare and very few examples of any comic to do so that's gone this long with such a single creator at the helm is very impressive. So a serious tip of the hat deserved to Eric Larson. The series was picked up by USA Network and got two seasons for a total of 26 episodes. If the Max was a step towards strange and wonderful and mature animation, Savage Dragon is a return to Saturday morning cartoons. But instead of X-Men or Spider-Man, this feels almost like 90s Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The main villain, Overlord, is similar to the Shredder. Excellent. My power base is growing. The freaks in the show are all basically mutants and a little more juvenile, and even the storytelling feels a bit derivative, and the quality of the animation pretty low, although without a proper DVD release, it might not be that fair for me to judge it so harshly. Larson himself said that he was pretty hands-off. He took his payday and let them do whatever they wanted, and I think that's reflected in the product. The dragon as a cartoon is incredibly generic. But if you're a fan of Savage Dragon, it's fun to see She-Dragon and Barbaric and other fan favorites pop up in the episodes. The bottom line for me? I can't not hear Jim Cummings, so all I hear is Darkwing Duck, and he plays like half the villains, I think, as well, so it's just the Darkwing Duck show for me, and... No, there are worse things. Probably the top of everybody's list is Spawn, which aired on HBO at midnight. And my copy, we got Triple Signature, Todd McFarlane, Ken Stacy, Tom Orjkowski, or or Orjkowski, I don't know, I, or, or, I'm just gonna keep saying Orjkowski, he's the letter. Spawn was an assassin with the CIA, who was killed in action and then goes to hell, makes a deal with the devil to come back to Earth to be with his wife again, but the devil screws him, gives him a rotten, disgusting body, jumbled up memories, and a weird symbiote suit with a living cape and chains. The series is usually about the decisions that Spawn has to make, and whether or not they're going to lead him to be a soldier for hell, or maybe something different. Out of all the Image Boys, I think Spawn was the breakaway success. It's the only other book next to Savage Dragon that's still ongoing monthly, although McFarlane doesn't handle 
all the chores the way Larson does, McFarlane was pretty good at keeping his schedule by focusing mostly on one monthly title, as opposed to other guys in Image who watered down their brands with too many similar books and blowing their deadlines. Spawn was multiple card sets, toys. I start this company to make the toys that you kids want. Spawn, Violator, here, now. These guys are bigger than life. Video games, this animated series, and a live action movie starring Martin Sheen, John Leguizamo, and Michael Jai White, developed by a key creator of Batman the Animated Series, Eric Radowski, whose biggest contribution to Batman might be his idea to draw on black paper instead of white to really darken the final product. You can see how that made him the perfect guy to bring a property like Spawn to life. And while it certainly pushed the boundaries of what Western animation expectations were in terms of maturity and darkness, it wasn't perfect. It kind of goes nowhere, like the Spawn comic itself, at least at the time. And after 18 episodes, it leaves us on an unresolved plot, leaving rewatch of the entire series ultimately unsatisfying. Maybe McFarlane should give up on his dream of another live-action movie currently stuck in purgatory and finish the animated Spawn series that everyone loved so well. Just a thought. The boss won't be happy when he hears about this. <laughs> you really fucked yourself this time. <laughs> oh, this ain't over so You made a fucking deal. <laughs> so that's it, right? Well, almost. There was a Gen 13 pilot in 1998 that was never released, but of course there are bootlegs floating around. I can't say that it's great, but it deserved to be released. Unfortunately, the series was made by Disney, and during production, Jim Lee sold Wildstorm to DC. DC is owned by Warner Brothers, and Disney had no interest in marketing their competitors' products for them and shelved the movie entirely. Ironically, the final product ended up being very similar to DC's animated universe that Warner Brothers already was producing and would have had an easy time blending in with those other titles. And that makes sense, knowing that the director, Kevin Altieri, was also a director on the Batman animated series. The cast is also pretty impressive, featuring Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers playing Grunge, Alicia Witt playing Fairchild, E.G. Daly as Freefall, the great Cloris Leachman was in it, Mark Hamill, John Delancey, I mean, come on, right? Oh, uh, no offense, but you're friggin' nuts, dude! So that's it for real this time, right? Well... Pretty much. Let's do the list. Todd McFarlane got a spawn. Jim Lee did Wildcats and Gen 13. Eric Larson had Savage Dragon. So out of the seven image creators originally, we got three and then we added uh, Sam Keith. So who's left? Wills Portacio had a series called Weapons that I think suffered from a lack of prompt issue releases, even though it was promoted fairly heavily. I've heard this was due to a personal family tragedy. I could never find any wet works on the shelf, so I don't think it got the recognition to warrant an animated series of its own. So for his first image book, Rob Liefeld made an Avengers-style government-sponsored team with a Hawkeye-esque character named Shaft as the leader, and it was called Young Blood. It got close enough to production of that animated series that we can see this demo reel, but that's it.
Mark Silvestri's first image book was Cyber Force. Um, it's a team book, kind of, if Wildcats was like the X-Men, Cyber Force would be like the uncanny X-Men. And I know there are people out there shaking their heads saying Stormwatch was the uncanny X-Men, but I'm afraid that is bullpucky. Stormwatch has been and always shall be the alpha flight to Wildcats X-Men. Now, pushing that aside for a moment, Silvestri got as far as some production sketches for characters, but that's about all we can look at. I think these are them, but they could also be somebody's deviant art that I found mislabeled someplace, in which case I apologize for spreading this information. Silvestri himself said that they had a show lined up to replace X-Men on Fox, which would have been huge, but it got cancelled before production started. Everyone at Image grew into their titles and brands differently. Silvestri, for example, broke ground with Cyberforce, but his imprint, Top Cow, only really found its identity with the creations of The Darkness and Witchblade, the latter of which did get developed into a live-action TV series as well as an anime that runs 24 episodes in 2006. Now, while it's not exactly what I wanted to cover on this list, it's worth mentioning at least. Ding. The series has a strange tone and features a mother and daughter who's like seven and constantly referencing her mom's big boobs, which is a little uncomfortable. Melanie? That's a good one. Cause your boobies are big like melons! <laughs> but this was never meant to be a straight adaptation of the comic and more of a reimagining of the series through the lens of anime, in which I think it's pretty successful. Now the final of the seven image founders is Jim Valentino, and his premier image title was Shadowhawk, and it's one of the least likely to be mined for material when producing children's cartoon series. He's a vigilante, who cripples criminals by intentionally breaking their spinal columns, and then it's later revealed that he has HIV. It's not really Saturday morning cartoon material. It would've been cool to see a Batman the Animated Series style visual aesthetic applied to a much darker character. Someone could still do it in Flash animation, but I'm not gonna hold my breath. But that's it. In recent years, we've seen some other image animated products like Invincible, but I just wanted to cover the core 90s image founders in this clip. I hope you guys all enjoyed this clip. Uh, it was sort of nostalgic, like I said. 1994 is a big year for image comics. Is uh, I was 14. Uh, so this has all just been great reminiscing and nostalgia and fun to go through all of my stuff and collectibles that I never throw away because I never throw anything away. Uh, we'll see you guys next week.